turn out and we just ask you to come out, bring a covered dish and, and uh, bring a chair and uh, enjoy the music. Uh, coming up Sunday school picnic will be uh, the 10th. So, and there's a sign up sheet back there if you'd like to sign up so they know how many's coming to, to get the chicken and stuff. Uh, next Saturday, with everything we have going on here, there will be no men's breakfast next Saturday, so men uh, take note of that. Uh, just one final announcement, I guess, and a lot of you know, but Emily had a little baby girl last Friday morning at uh, 3.13 in the morning. Uh, little Charlie Lynn was eight pounds, one ounce, and 19 inches tall, so. Nice little baby, huh? So, uh, they got home last night. They're doing, uh, mother and the baby's doing good. I'm not sure about Brett right now, but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and also, dealing with that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. If you would like to take a meal to that family, uh, feel free to partake or participate in that ministry, and the sheet's back there for, I think, the next two weeks. Okay, nothing else wrong? Okay, thank you, Tom. At this time, to open our service by singing this morning, please turn to hymn number 449. Hymn number 449. To God be the glory. I'd like for you to stand as we begin our service by singing all three verses. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened a life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus. The Son, give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly. the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Thank you, and you may be seated. Well, good morning. Good, morning. good to see each one of you here today, and I trust you've come expecting a blessing from the Lord and anticipating ways that you may be a blessing to one another. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 17 again, Acts chapter 17, and we're going to be finishing off a portion of scripture that we began to look at uh, last Sunday morning, but it is good to see each one of you here, and I want to welcome you. Uh, a couple of extra prayer requests. Uh, do continue praying for Dan Milton. He, he's having problems with his knee, his hip again, 
So uh, he appreciates praise and a lot of pain, and I know it's something which is uh, difficult for him to endure. So lift him up to the Lord in prayer if you would. And then Harvey also mentioned his niece in need of prayer for her health situation that she's in. Pray for the doctors to have wisdom. They're trying to figure out exactly uh, what's causing her health problems. And so uh, lift Brenda up to the Lord in prayer if you would. And then remember one another, the, the needs that are ongoing in the church. It is good to see Sally back with us this morning. Uh, but continue praying for her and praying for one another. Acts chapter 17, and I'm going to read from verse 10 down to verse 15 this morning. And the brethren immediately sent Paul away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which, or, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul of Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed." And we trust that the Lord will bless his word to us today. And our particular emphasis is going to be there in verse 11, where it speaks about the Bereans who were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer and seek his blessing upon us this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your greatness. We thank you, Lord, for your glory and holiness. And uh, Lord, we thank you for all that you are. Before we ever consider what you do, there are endless reasons to thank you for simply uh, who you are and your attributes. We thank you that uh, love and compassion and a desire to save is uh, a part of your uh, being. And we know that you have the desire to uh, save those who are lost. We thank you that you so loved the world that you would send your only begotten Son, that whosoever called on the name of the Lord would be saved. We thank you that uh, we are able to know of that salvation through your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that that is a confident assurance that each and every one here has this morning, uh, that their sins have been forgiven and that one day they will be in your presence. Lord, we thank you for each one who is here. We pray, Father, that you would be a blessing to us, that your word would uh, encourage our hearts. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in all that we say and do. Lord, we ask that you would continue to uh, help uh, Emily and, and Charlie as they are home now. We pray that you would just bless them and be with that young family. Uh, Father, we pray you would help them as they adjust. And uh, Lord, for Lily and Addie as well, as they get used to having a, a little sister. Father, we pray for others who are sick and, uh, Lord, uh, struggling with their health. We pray you would uh, bring them healing. Uh, Lord, use doctors if that be your will, or, uh, Lord, just your healing hand upon them we know is, is able. And we think of Brenda and others who are struggling. We pray you would be with them. Uh, Father, we ask that you would just bless us through this day. And once again, we ask that you would be glorified in all that we say and do. And this I ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you would now please turn to hymn number 459. Hymn number 459, He Lifted Me. <clears throat> In loving kindness, Jesus came my soul in mercy to reclaim and from the depths Sin and shame through grace he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me. With tender hand he lifted me. From chains of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name. He lifted me. sinking 
son, he lifted me with tender heart. He lifted me from shades of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name. He lifted me. His brow was pierced with many a thorn. His hand by cruel sinking sun he lifted me with tender hand he lifted me from shades of night to plains of light oh praise his name he lifted me <laughs> now on a higher plane I dwell and with my soul I know is well, yet how or why, I cannot tell, he should have lifted me, from sinking sand, he lifted me, with tender hand, he lifted me, from shades of night, to plains of light, oh praise his name, he me. Let's bow in prayer. Father, this morning again, we want to thank you for once again giving us an opportunity to come out and to gather together and to fellowship and to uh, worship you this morning. Father, we thank you for each one that has come. And Father, we thank you for the the uh, offertory this morning, for the monies that is given. Father, may we be wise stewards of these monies and be able to, again, use them and spend them in a way in which we can uh, further your gospel here in this community. And Father, we just thank you for each one that has, has given this morning. And Father, again, we think of the ones that couldn't be here this morning, be it on vacation or sick. Father, we pray that you put your protecting hand upon them. We ask all these things in thy name. Amen. This time, Junior Church can be dismissed. Again, if you're visiting with us this morning, and you have children ages three through seven, uh, they're more than welcome to get downstairs for uh, junior church this morning. Continuing with our service this morning, turn to hymn number 465 just before the pastor comes to speak this morning. Hymn number 465, Springs of Living Water. <clears throat> sin and shame and nothing satisfying there I found but to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came where springs of living water did abound drinking at the springs of living water happy now am I my soul they satisfy drinking at the springs of living water supply how sweet the living water from the hill of God it makes me glad and happy all the way now glory grace and blessing mark the path I've trod I'm shouting hallelujah every day drinking at the springs of living water happy now so they satisfy drinking at the springs of living water oh wonderful and bountiful supply oh sinner won't you come today to calvary a fountain air is flowing deep and wide the savior now invites you to the water free where thirsting spirits can be satisfied springs of living water happy now am i my soul they satisfy drinking at the springs of living water oh wonderful and
and bountiful supply. Well, again, it's good to see each one of you here this morning, and I do want to uh, say thank you again. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in a, a business meeting, the church voted to give my family and I a gift to help us as we uh, go over to uh, Britain for a, a visit, and that has been a blessing to us, and I wanted to just say how much we appreciated that. Uh, God willing, we'll be flying out a week tomorrow, and in my absence, uh, Pastor Johnson will be here, and uh, John Brown is going to be helping on Wednesday, so I appreciate those men stepping in um, and being a, a blessing to the church. So do pray for them and uh, look forward to hearing what the Lord puts on their heart. Uh, we're looking forward to going back, and uh, I try to be very careful not to refer to it as home. It's my home country, my hometown, but this, you know, Bedford is home to us now. So we're going for a visit to where it used to be home, uh, but then we'll be coming home uh, to family and friends here, and uh, we're looking forward to getting over there. Uh, there's a lot of people we want to see. There's a lot of foods that uh, we want to uh, try again. There's a lot of foods that's on the list, an awful lot of food. Um, but then we're looking forward to getting back here uh, and seeing what the Lord has for us as we continue to serve him again uh, together and moving into September. There are things happening that I'm excited about. Uh, I did want to mention again the uh, the Bible Institute that we're going to be starting uh, probably the second week in September. But keep an eye on our Facebook page and the church website. And the goal with this is it's going to be something we hope to help uh, in different ways. So if you just want to go into the word a little bit deeper uh, this morning morning, we're going to be in a very high-level way, kind of touching on inspiration and preservation and canonization and other shuns. And, you know, on a Sunday morning, regular Sunday services, it's hard to sometimes go into depth with all those things. So, you know, that's going to allow for that. And so if you simply want to know more about what we already teach here and go deeper into the Word and be more comprehensive, then that will be great for you. Uh, I think for those who teach and those who want to teach in their own families, uh, you know, a lot of fathers. I know want to teach their, their family the word, and this will be good for them. Um, but also if you want to maybe go into ministry, and for some reason uh, going into maybe a full-time college isn't a possibility, then, you know, this is something I hope will give a really good foundation. And it, it can't be as comprehensive as, you know, a full-time class load over a period of, you know, years. But one of the primary goals is not to be able just to give all the information, but to give you the tools to be able to grow yourself. And, and that is, is one of the, the key things that I want this to accomplish is that it, it you know, either helps continue or kickstarts or uh, really just emphasizes an ongoing ability to teach yourself the word. Uh, and so that's something that we're going to be beginning in um, September. So uh, there are some uh, booklets out there with some information if you want to have a look, but also keep an eye on the Facebook page and the church website. So lots of things happening that, you know, I'm excited about and just building on what's been going on here in the past uh, number of years and just seeing what the Lord has for us as we continue to worship and serve together. So in this morning, we're in Acts chapter 17. We've been working our way through the book of Acts, and it just gives us this wonderful uh, description of the, the early church, how they functioned, what they did, and how the Lord worked in them as individuals. And as you see this transition from Old Testament Israel to the New Testament church being made up of not just Israel, but being something where it was neither Jew nor Gentile. It wasn't bond or free. It's, it's something new. It was one one new man, one new entity where we're brought together in Christ. And you see as it develops through the book of Acts, you see how it moves from being a predominantly Jewish gathering to Jew and Gentile. And then the headquarters for uh, the church seemingly moves from Jerusalem to Antioch. And there they have this explosion of evangelism that goes around the region. And then with Paul and Barnabas and then Paul and Silas and Barnabas and uh, Mark, you have these missions teams spreading out around the Mediterranean. According to traditional uh, teachings and historical records, the apostles eventually would leave Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, Thomas, for example, is said to have gone all the way to India, and there are different teachings about where they went with the gospel. 
And so Acts gives us this account, and it also explains to us some of the early battles that they faced. What were some of the distractions that they had as a church, as individual believers? What was it that took their eyes off Christ and caused them to, to maybe forget the mission for a while, or at least have this you know, weakened perspective on what God wanted them to do, dangers from without as well as from within? And we also have the beginnings of many local churches, and we've seen a number of them as we've gone through the last few chapters. And a couple of weeks ago, they were in Thessalonica, and then we come to Berea. And that's where we began to look last week, and we kind of got stuck in the first part of that verse. And this morning, we're going to continue by thinking about how they searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And so as we think about searching the scriptures, why did they why did they search the scriptures? What was their anticipation, their goal? They knew that there was a treasure there. And the search for treasure is, is very much a human condition, isn't it? If you get home this afternoon and it pops up on Facebook that somebody, you know, over and ever it was fishing and they, you know, they were kind of bringing in the net and there was just a speck of gold in the net. How many people do you think would rush over to Everett? How many would go there and say, hey, I have this gold here, I'm going to start looking? How many would go over there and say, yeah, I fish here anyway, but, you know, they're looking for gold as well? You know, the, the idea of finding treasure, searching for treasure, captures people's imaginations. And, you know, you had the gold rush here in the 1840s and 50s, and it was incredible. I was reading this morning how that in kind of 1847, 1848, the known population, and while there may have been more, the known population in a particular area was 1,000 people. Within a year or two, that had jumped to 100,000. And then when the gold rush itself finally ended, over 300,000 people had headed out to California to find treasure. You know, that's something which is in our makeup. The Bereans, however, here, they knew that there was treasure in God's word to be found. The treasure of truth, the treasure of the revelation of who we are as sinners that need to be saved so that we can be reunited, that we can be united with our Creator, with God, to know that our sins are forgiven, to know that heaven one day will be our home. And knowing that truth was to be found in the Bible, they listened with all readiness of mind. That's what we looked at last week. We considered what it meant to receive the word. What does it mean to receive the word with readiness of mind? Well, we saw a few things just briefly. We prepare to listen and to learn by preparing spiritually. We want to make sure that things is to know that we are in union and in communion with our creator so that we can receive these things which are spiritual. We want to prepare physically to make sure that we are, to the best of our ability, able to hear and receive uh, in our physical being what needs to be received by God. So we want to make sure we're rested. We want to make sure that we are able to take on board what's being taught by the Word of God. And we set aside prejudice, we set aside presuppositions and presumptions, those things where maybe as something's being said, we assume something else is meant, and so we don't receive what's trying to be taught. You know, misunderstandings are frequent. Misunderstandings are so easy because either something isn't communicated clearly, or is it, it, we make an assumption about what the person's saying, and we get offended, we get mad, and we, so we disregard something that might actually be truth. And so when we come to the Word of God, when we come to hear the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God, we assess what is being said but we want to make sure that we don't allow presuppositions to rob us of what uh, needs to be learned. And so this morning, we were going to continue looking into this to see how they searched the Scriptures daily. They searched the Scriptures daily. That's going to be our emphasis today. There is treasure in the Word of God to be found. But we need to make sure that we're doing it very deliberately, very diligently. And I want to hopefully give you some tools this morning that will help you as we go along. Before we continue, though, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we approach your word here to, to proclaim it, to teach it and be, be taught from it, I ask that you would help. 
that your Holy Spirit would enlighten us, that you would cleanse me of any sin that must be confessed, that I might be a pure vessel uh, that can be used by you. I pray, Lord, that each one of us would be in a right relationship with you so that we may receive those things that are spiritually discerned. And Father, we look to you now for your help. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So to begin with, when we search the Word, we need to understand what the Word is, what to expect from it, and hopefully that you have a copy of the Word. Do you have a Bible? And I'm sure most of us here do, I'm sure everyone does, but do you have a Bible and do you actually read it? Is it something that you use on a daily basis? Is it something that you take and that you use? Do you have expectations from it that it is something that can bless you and help you? Do you have the Word of God? Is it a part of your life or is it a part of your weekend? You know, the Word of God is living, it is true, it is truth itself, and we need it. We know that God's Word is inspired. Uh, let's go over to Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Peter here, and in the lead up, has said something amazing. He talks about his personal experience in seeing Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. Uh, he's showing us that the written word of God that we have before us, that is reliable, that for a number of reasons we can know can be trusted, that is something sure and certain and true. It's a more sure word of prophecy. And in verse 20, he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not something that was originated from the heart of men and women where they sat down one day and said, I think this is a good idea that the world needs to hear about. You know, it came from God. The prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is one of those things that we'll teach in the Bible Institute, that we teach here as, as we preach and share the word, is when you let the word of God be its own interpreter. Uh, commentaries are wonderful. Listening to preachers is beneficial, and talking to brothers and sisters in Christ to learn is great. But when we let the Bible interpret itself, it can really be a help. And so that word moved there in verse 21. It's the same word used for a ship in Acts 27, 17, and it describes the wind filling the sails of a ship. It was, it was being driven, and that's the word driven that's used in the book of Acts. And so holy men of old were moved. They were driven like wind filling the sails of a ship and moving it along. The Holy Spirit filled these men and impressed upon them to write uh, not just the ideas of God, but the words of God. And so we have this idea of inspiration, um, Second uh, Timothy, if we go back a few pages to Second Timothy 3 and verse 16. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Now, all Scripture is God-breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so God's Word is inspired. It originates from Him. And the process of inspiration, when you think about it, is an evidence of the truth of God's Word in and of itself. The Bible not just being one book, but a collection of books, 66 books. God inspired 40 different authors written over 2,000 years, three different continents, three different languages, primarily Hebrew and Greek, but also some Aramaic in the book of Daniel. You think about who God used, different individuals. You know, there are people on an earthly level that we'll connect with, that we think along the same lines with. Sometimes you'll meet someone and you just realize your mind works in the same way. You know, you look at the men that God used and a lot of them were very different. Humanly speaking, they could not have been more different. You had a shepherd, kings, fishermen, prophets, a cupbearer, a priest, a Pharisee, tax collector, and so the list goes on. There's a, a great example if you think about inspiration and Moses writing the Pentateuch. You have revealed truth whereby God told Moses to write, where God would say, you know, essentially write down these words. 
there is experiential truth where Moses observed something and having observed it and the Holy Spirit authenticated it, there was then something written down. And there's also acquired truth whereby what was passed on through generations, again, what God had preserved, that God then inspired and used. And as one example of that, if you think of Genesis chapter one, how it begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Moses wasn't there in the beginning. And so you have essentially God said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you get to Genesis chapter 5, and at that point, it kind of changes tone. It's almost like a different segment in the book, and it begins with something along the lines of, this is the book of the generations. And so you have this kind of shift whereby there's knowledge directly given from God and then knowledge acquired that God has authenticated, but God used these different means. And one writer put it this way, the Holy Spirit illumined their minds, aided their memory, prompted them to write, repressed the influence of sin on their writings and guided them in the expression of their thoughts, even to the choice of their words. God's word is inspired. It is God breathed. And when we read it, we know that we can receive it as having been given by him. Time this morning would fail us to to look at every element of this, but you think about God's word being preserved in Psalm 119, 89, verse 89. It says about forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And I believe when you compare verses in 1 Peter and 1 Corinthians 2.13 as well, there's a contrast in 1 Corinthians 2.13 where it talks about the fact that we haven't received the words of man's wisdom, but of the Holy Spirit. And for inspiration to mean anything, there really needs to be preservation because this is great if what Paul and the churches who received his letters had, and they could look at it and say, well, this is the word of God. But then what then of the copies of the copies of the copies of the copies? If it's preserved in heaven, we know that's wonderful, but I believe we have reason to believe it's preserved for us here on earth. We can trust what we read, despite what many may say. Even this past week, I had someone say to me that the age-old comment, you can't trust the Bible, it was written by men. And so I got into a conversation, and the person eventually went to the line of, well, it's full of hundreds of mistakes. And I said, okay, well, tell me one, and let's discuss it. Because there are some passages which I wouldn't say are a mistake, but they're difficult to understand, and you've got to work through them. And so I said, okay, well, there are these, there are these many hundreds. It's full of them, according to him, on every page. Let's talk about one. And he said, oh, I read a book on it once, and I can't remember. And I'm like, well, if there's hundreds, then surely you can remember one. And they couldn't. And so very often when someone criticizes the Bible, to be honest, they, they don't have specifics. They have a vague idea. Uh, there are answers there, and we considered last week, I think it was Matthew Henry some 400 years ago, and he said that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't fear scrutiny. If we have questions, let's ask those questions, let's learn, let's take the word of God that is inspired and preserved, and we have what we refer to as the canon of scripture, the Old Testament from Genesis through to Malachi, you know, that was uh, analyzed. The, the children of Israel, according to God's own command, had uh, credentials that those books had to meet in order to be recognized as the word of God, and in the New Testament, it was the same thing. There were very specific tests that were to be uh, put to a book, and if it wasn't found to be true, it was disregarded. You know, Jesus Christ died somewhere, say, A.D. 33. By A.D. 140, you have 27 books of the New Testament being compiled and recognized as being authentic. Many of the early church writers would quote it to the extent that if the New Testament were for some reason to, to just disappear and be taken away, you could go to the early church fathers and compile the whole of the New Testament just from their quotes. Later on, uh, you had councils that would get together and they would say, we recognize formally these 27, but long before that, regular churches knew what was the New Testament, what was the Old Testament. No human council of men got together and said, we authenticate this and we say that this is the Bible. They recognized what it already was. And then the final step for us would be kind of translation in how we receive it. 
And so there are these steps that we look at, inspiration and preservation, canonization, and then translation, and we have the Word of God in our hands. With translation, again, there's, there's a wide discussion to be had. Uh, but when you compare what we have and you go back to generations, we have a reliable record in front of us. And so we start there when we think about what the Bereans were talking about. And of course, we're several steps removed in terms of language and, and culture and time. But what they searched, we can search. Now, they would have been searching the Old Testament. And so we can search the Old Testament, but of course they were comparing it with what Paul said. Remember what we learned in Acts 17, 2 and 3, that Paul's method was to take a claim about Jesus and an Old Testament passage and lay them side by side and prove that Jesus is the Christ. Do you have God's word? Do you use God's word? Do you read it? Another important step that we're aware of as we compare Scripture with Scripture is that there must be the witness of the Spirit within us. Spiritually, spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now, I believe that there are two hurdles that someone who isn't a Christian faces and that in their own strength they can't overcome. Number one, there's a spiritual moral dimension that they can't comprehend. But more so, it's that they won't accept it. First Corinthians in chapter two, first Corinthians chapter two, verse 14. He says, but the natural man, the, the one who is without Christ, who's yet carnal, who hasn't been, uh, you know, saved and, and re received the Holy Spirit, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man receiveth not. And the emphasis there is that they just don't want to accept it. A truth is told, and even if they can wrap their minds around it academically, in rebellion, they reject it. How many of us know, I, I'll pick on myself, yesterday we were trying to get through some zucchini. It's definitely zucchini season. If you ever come with this on a trip to England, it's not called zucchini, it's courgette. I'm consciously kind of translating as I go along. It's, it's going to be terrible over the next month as I prepare to go there and speak another English and then come back and speak your English as close as I can get to Pennsylvania English, and it's going to be a mess. But we had all this zucchini we were trying to get through. And so I thought, well, the best way to eat zucchini, the best way to eat any vegetable is to make it into a cake. So we made zucchini bread and we made some zucchini cookies and we had a certain amount left over. So someone took the initiative to say, well, let's just use all of it. So usually with cookie recipes, we double the recipe. This time it got times by five. And so if you see zucchini cookies downstairs, then um, even if you think, I don't need one today, take some for tomorrow. Because <laughs> we've got over 100 at the house, as well as like eight loaves and whatever else. And so I may look at those and think, well, I know that one is probably okay. Two might be a bit too much. Five is probably, you know, going overboard. If I sit down and have 10 with a glass of milk, you know, that's not good. I know that. I can wrap my head around it. But I may think about how good they taste. And so I choose not to receive that. I don't accept it. And I may even try and lie against it and say, well, it's made from vegetables. So it's good for me. And I deny the truth because I don't want to accept the truth. And these spiritual things, there's an element whereby the natural man receives them not. They receive not the things of God for their foolishness unto him. The natural man just says no in rebellion. There is an element of it as well, I believe, when you compare other passages whereby uh, the natural man can't comprehend moral things. It's just a different way of thinking. It's something which is outside of their ability but so much of it doesn't come down to the able to, but the want to. But if you are to get the most out of the word of God, you must have the witness of the spirit, the indwelling spirit that enlightens you. 
another one of those kind of shin words, preservation and canonization and inspiration, and it would be illumination. The Holy Spirit opening your mind to understand the truth that he has given to us. Now, we still need to work at it. That's going to be the next point. We study to show ourselves approved unto God. We need to work at knowing the word of God. We still need helpers. We need help from one another, from teachers in Ephesians 4. It makes that very clear. But what we need to begin with is being saved so that you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have the word of God before you and the Holy Spirit enlightens your mind to the word of God and you can begin to comprehend and receive and accept these things as truth. Something else we see back in Acts chapter 17 is they searched the scriptures daily. And I would always say that's where to, to begin when you want to understand the word of God is start by reading the word of God, not what books say about the word of God. Uh, you know, like I said, commentaries are great. They're wonderful. Uh, Bible software programs are great. But begin by reading the word. Search the scriptures and the way that they did it here is they searched it daily. There is daily work that must go into understanding the word of God, and it's an investment. And as with any investment, the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 tells us that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Think of some of the things that you have worked on. Some of the things you do that are difficult, they're hard, they're tough, they wear you out, it makes you tired, but at the end of the day, you know you've accomplished something, whether that be your vocation, or maybe it is a hobby, or just something you choose to do, think of something that has been work. And now, with that in mind, have you ever worked at understanding something in the Bible? I'm sure everyone has those days. No matter how much you love your job, no matter if you wake up in the morning and you think, it is so wonderful I get into going to work today. Even if you love the work you do, I am sure all of us have had those days where we get up in the morning and we think, no, nah, no, nah, not today. It might be the particular shift you have. It might be the length of time since you've last had a vacation and you just think, I love my job, but I just, I want to not do it for a while. You know, maybe you don't have that blessing of, of doing something you like, but you still get up and do it. You still get up and you go to work. You still go through that process and you work at it. The word of God should be a joy to us. We know it's work. We know it's difficult. We should be a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that shame isn't comparing ourselves with ourselves. Never stop. And sometimes the enemy will sneak into our minds and say, well, you're never going to understand it the way so-and-so does. Why even try? You know, it's not the type of thing where we compare ourselves with each other and say, well, they're going to know it better than I ever will, so why should I try? There is a blessing, there is a reward of value in simply you reading the Word and communion with God and seeking out treasure and finding that treasure for yourself. Study, work. Work at it daily. Do what you can to be under the preaching of the word. Be in fellowship with other Christians. And through the preaching of the word, be edified, be helped, be instructed. They had a foundation in the word of God itself. And, you know, sometimes we have to go back to basics and we all start somewhere. Many of you work in vocations that if I even attempted, you know, number one, they wouldn't let me in the building because I'm not, I, I don't have clearance and even if I could get in the building, I'm not going to know what I'm doing. But you didn't start at that level. You started somewhere else. And you know, the word of God, it may be that you start with the basics. What are the books of the Bible? Where are they? How can I even find them? One of the... I'm going to say tricks. That's not one of the illustrations I've done in youth meetings before 
is to print out all of the books of the Bible on little slips of paper, but then also I'll put in the book of Hezekiah. And I can't do that here now because the kids are all ready for it. But I would give it, you know, break up the youth into two teams and give both of them slips of paper with Genesis through Malachi, including the book of Hezekiah. And it's surprising how long they sit there trying to find where the book of Hezekiah goes and that there's not a book of Hezekiah. So it may be that that's where you start, just knowing what are the books of the Bible? How can I find them? What do I expect from them? How do I read it? You know, we, we talk about certain words which are unfamiliar in, in everyday usage, but, you know, we talk about our hermeneutic, you know, the, the study of how to interpret something. And in the context of the Bible, it's what is our way of reading the Word of God? And everybody has a hermeneutic, whether you know it or not. You, when you read the Bible, there is something that you subconsciously do to interpret it. So in the book of Psalms, when it says the Lord is a strong tower, I run into him, you don't think of a bricks and mortar place where you physically go. You understand that it's a tool of grammar, it's a tool of language. And so there's all these things that we can apply. Learn how to study the Bible. Learn what best works for you to interpret it, to understand the literal sense of the word, the historical sense, the grammatical, contextual. Put it together in order to know what it says. It has always been important to do this. But in the age of the internet, it's even more necessary than ever. They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Paul just breezed in out of nowhere and he started to tell them what this Bible says in the Old Testament. It's talking about a man, Jesus, who was born 45 years ago in, in Bethlehem and this is what happened to him. And he started to say, you know, Malachi says this and Jesus did this. And Isaiah said this and Jesus did this. And Deuteronomy says this and Jesus did this. And so you had the ones in Thessalonica who apparently listened and they said, yeah, we believe. The Bereans were more noble because they said, that's interesting. We received that, but we want to see it for ourselves. And they began to search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. Now, there's a danger. If I said to you, name me a false teacher prevalent today, hopefully you'd be able to name some. Because there are some names in popular Christianity, and I'm not going to go down through a list this morning, but their books are out there, their messages are out there, their information is there, and if we're not careful, any one of us can be taken in by false teachers and false teachings. And there's no possible way, and it's not the right thing, uh, you know, for you to have to trust someone else to say, you know, is this reliable? Now, let me clarify something there. If you're not sure, I'll be more than happy if you say to me, what do you think about this? I do that all the time. I, I go to others. There are people, you know, I've had conversations with different ones here and said, hey, what do you think about this? I've gone to other pastors and I'll say, hey, have you read this book? Is this author reliable? That's how we help each other. But there's got to be a, a level at which whereby we all say, okay, well, I'm reading this and that's not what the Bible says. That's just not true. Whether it be some politician trying to, to make a mark, whether it's a Bible teacher or a pastor or whatever it may be, we need to be able to line things up alongside the Word of God because from the very beginning we've been told that we are to be discerning. And that takes work. And just because we like something doesn't mean it's true. And then the final element that I would emphasize this morning is the will, the want to. Much comes down to whether or not a person wants to grow in grace and knowledge. And I would encourage you at some point, use a concordance, use Bible software. Um, I can recommend Bible software that's free. I can recommend Bible software that can cost you $7,000, whatever you want to put into it. And look at the times where it talks about growing in grace and knowledge. We don't want to emphasize one over the other. Are you growing in knowledge? 
What is your want to? What is your will? Do you want to know more of the word of God? Well, then you've got to do something about it. We don't absorb things simply by being close to them. If you have a Bible and it's on your bookshelf, then that may look good, but you're not going to learn anything until it's opened and you work at it and you read it and you understand it and then you apply it. When you look in Acts chapter 17, verse uh, 12, therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. They believed. The Thessalonians believed. There's one Greek word used for that. They were persuaded. But the belief that the Bereans had came from having studied their own, uh, to have come to the conclusions from verifying things. And along with belief, there would be obedience. In the final few verses, we see that trouble is stirred up again. Paul and his group are driven out and he goes to the next place. He goes to Athens and God willing, we'll pick up next week in verse 16. We're going to finish out uh, this chapter. The enemy never rests. Wherever Paul went, there was opposition. And the enemy never rests today. And so we need to search the scriptures daily. And so this morning, uh, we have three elements here we've looked at over the past two weeks that I want to ask you about. Do you receive the word? Do you receive the word? Do you accept it as being truth? Are you ready to try what you hear to make sure that it is so? Do you receive it to begin with? Have you accepted what it says? Have you accepted that base truth? that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that we are sinners deserving of judgment. We don't have to like the message. We don't have to say, well, I've got no problems at all. We may say, well, uh, you know, I I, I struggle to understand how a, a holy, loving God would send anyone to hell. We can have questions, but do you accept it at that base level and say, well, that's what it says? Have you received not only the truth about hell, but the truth about a Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, so that when he suffered, he suffered as if it were us. God the Father, looking on God the Son, accepted the punishment that was laid on his Son as being what was due to us. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 that he, Jesus Christ, became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when we call upon the name of the Lord, we're saved. He spoke to them in 1 Corinthians 15 of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel, is that the gospel that you believe, that you've received, that you accept as being true? Are you a child of God? And if you are a Christian, then are you searching it for treasure? Do you know that there is something in this book for you to learn from, to apply, to be helped by? Do you have a thirst for it and a desire for it? Do you look for the treasure that it contains? And do you believe and obey the word of God? If you've never taken that first step of receiving the gospel, then I would encourage you this morning, call upon the name of the Lord so that you can be saved. And if you have more questions about that, then as we stand to sing in just a moment, I'll be in the back there in the lobby and you'll be welcome to come uh, and speak with me or meet during the week and I'll explain things further. If you want to know more about searching the word, then begin by just reading it. And again, talk with me more if you want to know more about how to get the treasure from the word of God. Do you receive the word, search the word, and believe the word as the Bereans did? Let's close with a word of prayer, and then, uh, Ron, if you can lead us in our final hymn this morning. God in heaven, we thank you for this day, and Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's here. We know it's not by accident that you have brought us together this morning, but you have something for each and every one. Lord, I'm Lord, for your, your mercy in helping me to uh, study it and, and being given friends and family around me that can help me learn from it. Father, I pray that here this morning, everyone would know you as their savior. And if they do, they would have a thirst to know your word, to grow in grace and in knowledge. Father, I pray that you would work in our midst this morning. And this I ask in Jesus' holy name, amen.
Please take your hymnal in closing. Turn hymn number 210. Saved by the blood. We'll sing the first and fourth verses. Please stand as we do as we close our program this morning. Hymn number 210. <clears throat> Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and pray to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save my sin. Are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Save, save. I'm the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son. Sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Save, save, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Before I pray, I just want to remind you once again of our fellowship dinner downstairs. Maybe you wasn't prepared this morning, but you're more than welcome to join with us to fellowship. That's what it's all about. Come down and uh, again, fellowship, and we'll just have a good good time uh, around God's table this morning. Let's bow in prayer. Father, again this morning, we thank you for once again this opportunity to come out and to hear your word. Father, we thank you for each one that has come. And Father, we pray a special blessing upon this meal which we're about to partake. And Father, we thank you for the ones that's prepared, and, and Father, we trust that it will nourish our bodies. Father, we thank you for the fellowship that we can have with brothers and sisters of like precious faith. Father, we just pray for each one of us, and then as we journey to our homes, that you give us safe travel.